Hello and welcome to the Supernatural Fandom Track here at Continual. And tonight we are really going to be talking about season four and what uh, what we thought were the best episodes, what we liked about the season, and where we disagreed with maybe some of the other rankings. But first, let's let all of the wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Carol. Hi, Hi. I'm Carol Stokes. Oh, Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Which one? But anyway, go ahead. Rock paper scissors. That's right. Rock paper scissors. Uh, Well, Carol's to my right on the screen. Nobody else probably has that same configuration. But let's start with Carol Stokes, and I will now remember to call names. Go ahead, Carol Stokes. Uh, Carol Stokes. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) Long time fan since season three started writing fic in 2012. You can find all my fic on AO3 under Firesign10, and I'm on Twitter under true underscore Firesign10. And Alex. Hey guys, uh, I'm Alexander Gideon. Um, My writing style can best be summed up by the phrase, and many people died. I am the author of A Web of Crimson. It is the first book of the law from the Shadow Council archives from uh, Falstaff Books. If you like Alistair Crowley, um, it's a great series. Um, the, the whole um, Shadow Council archives has a kind of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen kind of feel to it. Uh, so you've got historical fantasy, historical um, science fiction, all of those. We're playing around with uh, historical figures and and uh, pity dreadful monsters and it's Just a great time. Okay, Electra? I'm Electra Hammond. I'm a writer and an editor, and you can find me here and there and all around. And Carol Malcolm. I love that, here and there and all around. Yeah, that certain days, that would probably be me as well. But yes, I'm Carol Malcolm. I'm the director of the Dragon Con Urban Fantasy Track, and we do cover Supernatural on the track, so... I also started uh, this, I guess it was in the winter, you know, we'd been in the habit of doing so many virtual panels anyway, since DragonCon was completely virtual last year, that I thought, you know what, it's been a really long time. I've been watching the show since it first aired, I mean, I you know, all along, but I, I had not gone back and watched some of the very early episodes in quite a while, and, you know, that was a long time ago, so I thought, you know, I really should start some kind of a, you know, what I'm calling a rewind, going back to the beginning. So we've been doing that, and uh, we'll be doing uh, season five later this month. Okay. Well, to kick us off with all the wonderful and high drama episodes in season four, what's your favorite? And I'm going to go back around and start with Carol Malcolm this time. You know, I have... I have a few different favorites and for different reasons. I really, I really enjoyed the, the monster movie one just because it's fun, because it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's, there's some meta aspects to it as well. So I, you know, I enjoyed that, but I think, and, and of course, yellow fever for kind of the same reason, it's fun to see you know, Dean being scared of anything, which he doesn't usually like, you know, and so that's amusing, and uh, of course, the montage at the end with the, with the song, the lip sync is, is awesome, but I think if it comes to, you know, the, the, my favorites for, other than just pure enjoyment, it would, it would be, there's a monster at the end of the book, because I think that's very important. And I do really enjoy all of the meta stuff that they do. And that one, you know, really got things uh, started. Plus we meet Chuck and there are some absolutely great lines in that in that episode. And I think uh, from all of them, they all get in there, you know, some good ones. And I think uh, but then probably my other favorite is probably Heaven and Hell just because we find out a bit more about what's going on between 
you know, between heaven and hell and, you know, we get the set up and, uh, you know, the little bit of there's a twist and a surprise. So it, I think it's kind of satisfies a lot of the things that we expect from the show in that one episode. Okay. And Electra. Um, hands down, my absolute favorite at this point was in the beginning. Oh yeah. That's another because one of my in, in the beginning, filled in so many pieces of the puzzle for me it it my god we found out that mary was a hunter after three three seasons of learning that they found out all about hunting from their dad john who took it up after mary's death we discover mary'd been a hunter all along and came from a family of hunters and we discovered the reason that you know Dean had inherited an Impala from his dad is because he steered his dad into buying the Impala <laughs> instead of a VW minibus. I mean, my God, <laughs> what a different <laughs> series it would have been if they'd been driving, you know, the Scooby bus. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are so many pieces there that they couldn't fix, but that that's the whole piece of it. And on top of that, uh, six seasons later, we discover that if that had gone differently, they would have been living in apocalypse world or not living in apocalypse world. That that is, that's a huge pivot point. So that one just folded in so many pieces and watching it again, it's, but yeah, the monster at the end of the book is definitely close second. Okay, Alexander? So I am, a big fan of Christopher Heyerdahl's Alistair. Um, Alistair was my favorite villain throughout the entire series. Um, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I loved him. I loved his acting in it. And his, he has that kind of quality as, as Alistair, kind of like Bill Nye does, the, the British Bill Nye, um, in that if anyone else did it that way, it would just seem like, too much but it was just it was just perfect when he did it um so on the head of a pen is my favorite episode in this season and kind of in general just just that back and forth between alistair and dean when he's you know he's up on the the big um 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 hexagram had to think of it he's on the like chained to it and everything and dean's just like pouring the salt down his throat and you know injecting him with with holy water and and, and going out and just just the quantity that he has he's talking dean it was, it was just so perfect and I, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I loved him um which makes uh, When the Levee Breaks um, my second favorite uh, of the episodes. I love seeing um, Sam going through all of the like hallucinations as he's going through the withdrawals. And I loved that moment when he hallucinates Alistair being there. And just of all of the things, even though he killed Alistair himself, of all of the things that he could have imagined in that moment, it was Alistair that made him afraid. And just that moment when he picks up that scalpel and he's like, all oh, the familiar places. And I was just like, yes, <laughs> it was perfect. I wanted more of him. And I was so sad that they, they, he only got like three episodes total, four episodes of Alistair and three episodes with Christopher Heyerdahl. Um, so yeah, I really wanted more, more Alistair, but those are definitely my two favorites. Okay, how about you, Carol Stokes? Um, I kind of have to go with what Carol said. There's the ones you simply enjoy for enjoyment's sake, which for me are, are things like um, After School Special, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a Terrible Life, uh, Monster Movie, those ones where they really get to do something outside the box. You know, they get to play a little bit. They're having fun, we're having fun. It still advances the story which also really then brings me to the other thing, which is that this season, I think more than the previous three is so cohesive in its storyline. Every single episode, even a monster of the week pertains to the main storyline and contributes something, some 
little particles, something. I mean, even, uh, you know, we're looking at the Rougarou. And even there, you know, because we're getting Sam trying desperately to feel like you don't have to be a monster, you can change it. I mean, everyone, whereas in the past couple of uh, seasons, some have simply been standalone MOWs, Monsters of the Week. This one, everything is tied in. It is so tight. It is so strong in that aspect that as far as a good episode it's actually difficult it was difficult for me to look at this list and say well because each one i was like yeah but this one gives us this and <laughs> right, gives right. Us that and maybe i don't care for this one so much like let's say uh oh gosh see i i, I can't even i can't even pick even let's say wishful thinking which has some humorous stuff and everything but every single one has something to contribute from the very beginning of Dean and Lazarus rising to the very end when Lucifer rises. And that just makes really compelling viewing, you know, yeah. really compelling. So I won't say every episode is the same amount of goodness, but you know, <laughs> the same I, level. But <laughs> right, because let's face it, nobody is usually a real big fan of Chris Angel as a douchebag. Okay, that's okay. often pointed out as one of the weaker episodes. <laughs> but it gives us something very important. Sam doesn't want to be an old man alone, still mm -hmm. hunting. He wants to end it now. He doesn't want to end up in that desperate place. And so if nothing else, that's what that episode gives us. And there is Sam's motivation for the entire second half of the season. So it all ties in. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. and I agree. I mean, for sheer enjoyment, uh, I really love the, the fun ones, Yellow Fever, uh, Monster at the End of the Book. Um, you know, It's a Terrible Life. Those, those are great to watch over and over again. I actually do like Chris Angel's a Douchebag for, because I thought it had a very solid Monster of the Week plot. I thought that was very mm -hmm. well written and kept us guessing you know, the whole way through. And like Carol said, I, I love that it, sets up Sam's motivation because until then Sam was really trying to keep his word to Dean and he had said he wasn't going to use the demon blood and he had turned Ruby away and then Dean makes his little speech about how we're all going to die bloody and and there really isn't any way out of this and you can just see it click with Sam that if Dean's resigned to that well somebody's got to do something and it's going to be him and he's going to use what he has to do it and um, I, I really, that hit me very hard. Um, jump I did the like Barry Bostwick a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jump the Shark was also um, a more serious favorite of mine because we do get to see the whole setup with Adam. And even though it's dead Adam, um, it's still really fascinating to watch Sam and Dean's reaction to this idea that they have a secret half-brother. And, and when, yeah, and once again, there's a building block in place we don't even know yet. No. But if we didn't have this episode, we couldn't have Adam in season five. They right. have to establish that there's Adam, he's the bloodline, he's of the Winchesters, he has to already be in place. And that's the episode that does it. Without it, you know, the he, he's the tower falls. Yeah, he's the convenient disposable Winchester. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or yes there for the plot device um I, I think the biggest thing that hits me whenever i watch this season is all the turning points and opportunities missed where if dean could have uh and if he'd have backed sam's play ruby never would have gotten her hooks into it and i think that coming off of hell and being traumatized from hell and being feeling so much guilt over what he did left him very vulnerable to the the angels manipulating him because he wanted absolution so bad and i think without the hell experience he would have just said screw all of you i'm back in my brother he might be wrong but we'll go down together and i think it would have gone in a very different direction so um I, I find those inflection moments to be kind of fascinating. It's like, if you just knew then what you know now, would you have played it differently, Dean? Um, 
and we'll never know except in fan fiction so <laughs> now now i i want to point out one other favorite moment not necessarily a favorite episode but that first episode where after all of the the wonderful stuff chasing around with dean proving that in fact he is not a monster and he is really dean and he has no idea how he got there where they finally summon castiel and he walks through past all of all of the things they have done to protect themselves and they fire the rock salt at him and that does nothing and the demon killing knife does nothing and and he looks at them and they're like who are you what are you and you know i i, I grabbed you and i raised you up from perdition and what are you i am an angel of the lord and you see that first view of of the wings behind him yeah mm -hmm. and then you know and all through the series after that you will always see that on on you know your first view of, of a major angel you will always see the wings mm -hmm. and what is it season 14 where we finally see that on dean when, when michael takes him over and yeah. you see him standing there with the wings behind him and it the parallels to that scene are just incredible yeah God, these guys were patient <laughs> yeah somebody referred to the whole dean saying yes to michael in season 14 as the longest wait for chekhov's reveal <laughs> you know, that, a bit about if you see the gun in, in um, the first uh, part of the play, it has to fire by the third part. And they said that was that was one of them. So looking yes. at what Entertainment Weekly rated in their top 75 episodes, and what they did was, this was prior to season 15, they went through and said, if you only watch 75 episodes of Supernatural, which would be the ones that would at least let you get the gist of the show? Now, all true fans are going, only 75. <laughs> it's Watch worse. them all. It's not possible. Yeah, the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> yeah. And so basically they picked usually about five episodes as their essentials, leaving all the rest as non-essentials. So this is where we get to, you know, throw down. Here are their essential episodes. Lazarus Rising, In the Beginning, Yellow Fever, I know what you did last summer, heaven and hell, monster at the end of the book, I guess they had more than five, when the levee breaks and Lucifer rising. What do you think, uh, Electra? I can't argue with any of those. It's just, there were some in there I really, really liked and I wish they had included. There were, like, there were so many more in there that I'm just like, in love with, I guess. And I, I know I'm gonna argue with, with some folks about which ones. Um, I mean, I think It's a Terrible Life is, is one that, that you gotta include because it's the first time you really see the angel manipulation of the, well, can I get them to do this? And can I get them to do this? And can I get them to do this? And, and just how strongly they want to be together and how fast they will turn around and say, we're gonna find the monster. This is what we <laughs> gotta do. It, it's, you know, and it was an angel they didn't know and they showed him. Mm -hmm. hmm. Alexander? Weirdly enough, I kind of agree with them on like the the essential episodes. I would take Yellow Fever out. I I love the episode; it's a great episode. It is not essential to the plot of it, but yeah, I would say Lazarus Rising um, in the beginning. That was um, I know what you did last summer: Heaven and Hell with the Levy Breaks and Lucifer Rising mm -hmm. for big points to get the big gist of the uh of the season yeah i think that's actually fairly spot on on the most important episodes of the season um i mean of course there are ones that i would like included just because they're my favorites but i mean one of my favorites is included on there um if i had to re if i had to go with the amount of episodes that they went and change yellow fever let me see 
I would have to say possibly adding are you there god it's me dean winchester and having the witnesses and showing the breaking of the first seal because that that introduced that and you get a lot of that like guilt over the the past um uh, people they've lost and and are, are coming back from them you get a little bit more into bobby's past with with that episode as well um so i'd say i would probably replace yellow fever with that one but i i can't argue with any of the rest of the of the episodes okay carol stokes um certainly what was it so lazarus rising are you there god yes was that them i'm sorry lazarus rising <laughs> in the beginning yellow fever uh i know what you did last summer heaven and hell um monster at the end of this book right yeah there's a lot of uh, them in this one and, yeah, and then the last one. two that's why i can only yeah. retain five <laughs> yeah. i would i would personally throw yellow fever and maybe heaven and hell back into the pool. I actually like metamorphosis because we see Sam. Oh, I know it's icky. It's awful. It really is. It's gross. It's one of the really gross ones. Man, that guy when he's eating that burger out of at the. Oh. <laughs> However, it really gives us a really clear example of Sam's struggle. Uh, to not become a monster that he has he's this kind of train is starting to roll along but he feels he's still trying to get control of it and there are still options you know and that struggle i think is sam's struggle throughout this episode he is constantly trying to do the right thing even though dean and others are telling him he's going about it the wrong way you know, his motives are good, his intentions are good. And I think that episode really exemplifies that. And yeah, I know what you did last, last summer. We have to see that because we have to see how Ruby got at him, you know, so deeply. So, and part of it was because he was so alone. And she not only reached out to him to build his power and his skills, but in a really personal way. <laughs> And he needed that. He desperately needed that. Um, but I think maybe instead of heaven and hell, a lot goes on in heaven and hell. Don't get me wrong. I like death takes a holiday because there you, we're dealing one of the first times with a lot of death. You know, we're back to the reapers that we haven't seen in quite a while, but like, what is their role? What is death's role? in the world and what happens when it's not working and Pamela comes on the scene invaluable ally who ends up losing her life over this and that pivotal moment where she says to Sam you think you're doing this for the right reasons and you're not you know she really calls him out it's her dying declaration that she's like dude this is not this is not going well <laughs> right and, and they're working together, but there's still a lot of stuff going on. So it, I think it's a more subtle kind of episode, but I think in terms of them dealing with what is death, how do we deal with death, and what, what ends up happening with the demons and Pamela, that's, that's important. Okay, Carol, 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 Carol Malcolm. I, you know, I'm, uh... I'm kind of on board with this list pretty well, too. I mean, I think that they do a good job of picking out the ones that if they're supposed to be essential to understanding what's going on in the beginning, absolutely, uh, you know, and there's a monster at the end of this book and uh, heaven and hell, you know, heaven and hell for a while. I mean, in terms of kind of getting the setup for what's going to be coming. And uh, you certainly with the um, monster at the end of this book. And I, I think that probably the only one that I would have left off, and I do agree that both Lazarus Rising and, and Lucifer Rising are a great way to begin and end. And it's a, you know, a great bookend uh, for, the, for the season. But I, the, in the beginning, or not in the beginning, the, the one that uh, I know what you did last summer, um, I, I agree that we need to know, you know, well, how it was that basically Ruby got her hooks into Sam. And, you know, it's sad when we find out a little 
ways later that, you know, she got her hooks into him for a reason completely opposite than, you know, than what he was being led to believe. I, I do think that aspect of it was important, but I think that if one was, if I was going to leave one off of that list, that would be the one I would do because I think that that part of it could have been maybe woven into another episode you know, that aspect of showing, because the whole episode wasn't just that. So anyway, but I, I actually think it's a pretty good list. My my three top favorites from the season are on here. <laughs> it doesn't usually happen, or at least it hasn't well, so far. So, you know, I think, uh, I, I think it's actually a pretty good, uh, um, you know, and as I think it was Alex pointed out, there are quite a few of them, which so that's what seven, and usually they're they only have what three or four per season. Yeah, so probably, usually yeah. it's it's more than five. So yeah, and so you know, in this case, it does give you a kind of a broader view of of what's going mm -hmm. on. Yellow fever probably just put in there because of the montage. Let's face it. <laughs> Quest, question: <laughs> If they leave off jump the shark. What happens later if you haven't seen that one and Adam just appears and you're like, oh, right, yeah, that's our brother. <laughs> well, you know, my issue with that episode, though, is that I thought, not the episode itself necessarily, but I just thought it was a really awful way to introduce the fact that they had a brother. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it's bad. I mean, they you know, what the person that they were getting to know a little bit and were getting attached to was really a ghoul. <laughs> it's not, yeah, that was depressing as heck. It, it, yeah, I mean, I, so I think that's, I just think that one. It would have been so that much more awesome if he turned out to really you know, be somebody <laughs> human. And maybe yeah, they didn't although, realize there were going to be 11 more seasons and they were going to yeah. need him. <laughs> or then also he would have if, if he had turned out to really be the real adam then he would have filed that under john winchester's a plus parent <laughs> right right it's like <laughs> once again surprise, surprise. <laughs> and I, I mean the uh and there were a lot of things i liked about the episode don't get me wrong and i agree that we have to you know some of his background where did he come from what was the story about him before he shows up later mm -hmm. but you know, I just, I felt as though it was just not the ideal way to introduce a sibling. Even if they had only known him a brief time and he got killed off, I think it been a little better than what, you know, when Dean finds his body there in that tomb and it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, I've only so known him the breaks, <laughs> but still, you know, it's, uh, I don't know that that's just my take on that particular aspect of the episode anyway he got the sh super short end of the stick and always it, he did finally though get pulled out of hell by the 15th season i mean you know <laughs> they didn't leave him there forever yes and then he came to a negotiation <laughs> with michael but uh, yeah. you know he really didn't win no i i think if i were gonna change it at all as much as i love yellow fever and as much of it is a fan favorite which is i think why it made the list i would probably have to replace it with jump the shark for all the reasons we've just discussed in terms of what's essential to carry forward but the one that always sticks with me is sex and violence the one with the siren maybe in part because the siren then went on to play Hoyt Fortenberry in True Blood and yeah. we all from that. Um, but it's, I, I always thought it was interesting, it, several things about that episode. One is the boys are so on edge, they don't take away the real lesson, which is the siren pits people against the person they love the most. Mm -hmm. So while Dean's off having his feelings hurt about Ruby and Sam's off, you know, feeling bad about all the other things, they missed the whole lesson of the siren, which is he wouldn't have tried to kill you if you weren't the person he loved the most, um, which they're both bad about remembering. Um, I think it's also interesting that Sam, 
the things that Sam and Dean are moved to say to each other under the siren spell are very different. And while Sam punches Dean, Dean's the one who tries to grab the ax. Right. So that always struck me as something that really needed to be talked about later because um, it could be construed as telling Sam, I'm done trying to save you. And I think Sam would take it that way, that he had crossed a, a, a line from which there was no coming back because Sam wasn't really trying to kill Dean. Dean was unquestionably between the knife and the ax trying to kill Sam. And uh, I'm thinking that would cause some problems, but also what they <laughs> said to each other, um, Sam's still talking about, I'm a better hunter. I'm, I'm, uh, you're, you're weak, which is Winchester language for, you're kind of broken right now. You're more broken than I am right now, uh, which was possibly true. Um, Dean is really laying into him for all those ways Sam failed him, which comes back again at the end of season eight, you know, what he can, what Sam confessed. So I think from a um, getting into the psyches of the brothers and where they are right then, that episode um, is, is more crucial than it sometimes gets um, okay. credit for. And the um, other, go ahead. On, on a minor point with that episode, is that the first time where we see the FBI trick where oh yeah, call my supervisor. And it turns out Bobby's got a whole bunch of labor yes. phones. Yes, it is. Yeah, I made a note about crucial that. Yeah. later, including mm -hmm. when, um, oh, I've lost his name. Uh, when what's his name takes over for him, the werewolf Garth. takes over for Bobby. Garth. When Garth takes over and he's got a whole bunch of, of cell phones in his jacket. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I called it Bobby's wall of phones in my notes. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was and like, that, look, there it is. That's a terrific trick yeah. that they used time and time again later. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the crotchety FBI supervisor. You know, what do you want? Yes, of course I sent my guys there. One of the things that also really struck me on the rewatch was Sam gets blamed for being tricked by Ruby. But, you know, there's a long while there where Dean is, a, is kind of getting sucked into it too. She's very convincing. And it isn't until later that you start to see some of the cracks, but for a while there, Dean isn't crazy about her as an ally, but he can't argue with the fact that she's helping. And of he course, later on- He accepts her, yeah. Yeah, right. after, uh, later on, all of those uh, reservations go right out the window when it comes to like Crowley and Rowena and, you know, Heck, why friend sucked in a number of times by a bunch of people. You know. why, why befriend a demon when you can hang out with the king and queen of hell? Yeah. Um, so, I know how to party. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that did strike me as Sam gets blamed for it, but Dean was right there on crazy train with him for a while. Kitty! You can do yeah. the penalty. Okay. So <laughs> we also have the introduction of the angels in season four. Mm -hmm whom Sam and Dean didn't even believe in. Sam, well, Dean didn't believe in Sam. You know, we know from Houses of the Holy, did believe in God and angels, which is just so cruel. And um, then they get the angels. There's that whole rant he, Dean does in Houses of the Holy about, you know, well, yeah, angels are just on, on the does, don't exist list. Yeah. Um, and then he can God off with Sam and say, if you need this, go ahead. But, you know, Dean doesn't. And then we get the angels we get. Um, what do you think about the whole angel progression that we see and the development of them in season four? Because, you know, that's definitely one of those areas that the fandom throws down some gauntlets. Um, Alexander? <laughs> so progression of them, I, I think, honestly, Cass is, is the only angel that was really kind of interesting. Anna was 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 fairly interesting. The cast is the only one that really kind of questioned things. It was kind of black and white with most everyone else, which is what you know why Cass became a mainstay instead of everybody else. Um, I will say that some of my favorite deaths were angels. 
um loved watching uriel die <laughs> um and i know it, it doesn't happen if i'm not mistaken it doesn't happen in um season four but zachariah mm-hmm. it doesn't Zachari- zachariah um he is was one of the best like pseudo villain-esque kind of on the fence but he was just such a dick <laughs> like yeah you just you just wanted him to die so hard and almost almost from the beginning there was just something about the way he, um i can't remember the actor's name but the way Kirk he played Kirk yes Kirk. um the way he played zachariah that like from the beginning the first time you see him you're like <laughs> mm, no no not this guy i just and you don't even know he's an angel yet but like he, he comes in, you just see him as that executive and it's it was such a great parallel because that's what he is he's you know he's he's not a bad guy he's a businessman and he's trying to sell a product in which is the wholesale destruction of the earth he that's what he's <laughs> trying to sell <laughs> and, and it's just like I think I think it was kind of what they were also going with in um, later on with uh, Dick Roman, kind of that same uh, and and they did it fairly well. But I think Zachariah was was a much better like version of that just soulless businessman. Um, but that that progression, you know, I I think to me only only Cass and Anna kind of had a progression, kind of saw outside of this these are your orders you stick to them and saw that maybe there could be something more to it and you kind of get that dichotomy between them and Cass being less willing to go against uh um what heaven is is telling him and and what his orders are with anna being completely on the i'm a fallen angel and screw what heaven thinks i'm gonna do this but also with what Anna was doing would have actually have solved the problems. They aren't the best way to go about it, but would have solved issues. And we don't, we don't get that with Cass as much. Cass kind of bumbles along <laughs> and doesn't really accomplish much of anything until the very end. Mm-hmm. Electra? Um. One of the things on on looking at this again is how much Misha Collins did with just looks early on. He talked much less and just did it all with his eyes and his face Mm -hmm. and the way he tilted his head. It it was all just a sort of... (laughs) And he, he just, he acted the hell out of it without saying anything. And it was it was sort of almost inhuman the way he did it early on. And then I've lost the name of the episode. I can look it up where he was Jimmy the Rapture when he's Jimmy Uh Novak and he's completely different. Mm -hmm. It's it's a tribute to just how good he is. Even before he was established Castiel, he he not only the character has a progression but he he that's all him Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the voice was so different between Cass and Jimmy and of course we've all heard his story about how if he knew he was going to be on the show for 10 years he might not have done that to his vocal cords (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Malcolm well I'm gonna say that I I'm not sure I know that there are a lot of people who were displeased with the entrance of the angels all i know is that when i saw it i was like yes because i thought this because that whole aspect you know angel lore is is fascinating and if you're looking for the other side of the coin from from demons you know who there there are a lot of similarities uh you know that uh, between them and i i mean i i was thrilled when they brought them in one of the things that i find interesting is thing and i had forgotten since i had seen a lot of this season prior to you know re-watching it last month i hadn't seen a lot of it in a while and i had forgotten how different kaz was in the beginning his demeanor was like 
and yes, as you're saying, even some of his speech patterns and things like that. And I don't mean between he and Jimmy. I mean, just between, you know, how he, you know, what we hear and see from him in the future and how he changes. Uh, and, I, you know, but, but just within the, I think over the course of the fourth season, we do see, you know, we see what he goes through. Anna's kind of his mentor in a way. Mm -hmm. In terms of, okay, you know, he has not at that point, uh, when they speak about it, he's not truly fallen yet. But the fact that he's, you know, considering uh, that there that not everything he's been told is maybe correct. And he's questioning, he tells her that in the very, the very first time the two of them do speak. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, that I think it was Alex's comment that um, that really they're they're the two that we see actually evolve. But I think by seeing what the other angels were like, it you know it reinforces that that fact that yes, these are warriors. That is what they are, and you know they they might be devious and cutthroat to get their way. Now I'm not trying to make excuses for them. I'm just saying that's what they're supposed to be. And, you know, of course, you're going to have people who misinterpret, you know, this, this is, they think that the best way to get things, for, you know, to get from point A to point C is to skip B and to just go around and do their own thing instead of going through the steps that they need to and, you know, doing, you know, doing whatever they think God's will might be instead it's being reinterpreted because he's not there and what you know all of that um that, that we find out but I you know I, I I love that they brought them in I to me I think it added something and I know that um within within fandom over years there you know there are a lot of people who say oh we should have stuck just with the monster of the week episodes that's it you know, two guys out driving in a car and I'm thinking you can't do that for 15 years and not make it, not make it something and, and make it something special. You really can't do that. So, and I still feel that way. So I'm very glad that they, that they did that. There's an article in Variety mm -hmm. where they're asking Kripke about it. And he said that they were doing a lot of demon stories. And they were kicking around at the end of season three, what are they going to do? And they were talking about angels, but they didn't want to make them be a warm, fuzzy, helpful force. And then they came up with the idea that angels could be dicks and they had it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and because they had to, they had to have something to oppose the demons. Mm -hmm. And I agree that um, the angel and demon aspect, bringing in the angels, um, definitely leveled the the arcs up to be bigger and yeah we probably much as we all love the monster of the week set week episodes we probably couldn't have sustained 13 years just on that we needed mm -hmm. some bigger storylines um i think and and the angels being dicks doesn't really surprise me because if you know if you go back to the actual stories about angels none of them volunteer to help people unless they're sent to do it none of them walk among people going oh you poor person let me help you with all my grace no they no they but we, we've it. seen that though i mean we've had tv shows all about you know angels on yeah. earth where every week they help somebody that's been done well not only has it been done but if you look at the actual lore they don't unless they were told to go do it um you know, and so you kind of look at that going, okay, yeah, I mean, it's a little more on point than, than uh, I'm comfortable with, but that's cool. And I, I think still can, can um, my biggest issue with the angels in season four is that cast us some pretty crappy things that never really get called on. You're letting Sam out of the um, panic room and letting Sam take the blame for it, keeping Dean in the green room and never, and when he knew what was going on and not helping stop it and not telling them about the voicemail. And um, th there's never any accountability for that. And I, I never trusted him because of that, even though I know he does do some things to make up that 
there right. were still a lot of things he didn't. He, and he didn't I didn't seem to be on their side until no. until the showdown with Uriel. And then he picked sides. And even the angels waiting until Dean had broken to pull him out of hell. If they could have pulled him out of hell, they could have pulled him out before he stepped down. They could have prevented all the seals from breaking. And they didn't. And so that always kind of sticks in my craw with the angels. Um, and I know that's an unpopular opinion. And I think they're important for the show as a whole. But I'm not a big angel fan because of that. It just doesn't get, there isn't accountability for it later because Sam takes the brunt of it all when they were getting screwed left and right by the angels. Carol? A lot of people have already said, you know, a good deal now about, um, about the entire, speaking just for season four, just looking at season four, not looking ahead. <laughs> I really liked the entrance of Cass. I mm -hmm. thought it was super powerful, really changed the whole playing field for me. You know, yeah. wow, this is, this is big. This is something really big. He, um, he conveyed a lot of power. Um, and he was so, uh, it was such an interesting entrance that I didn't even think to ask some of those questions that we asked later, like, well, why didn't they pull Dean out sooner? Like you said, they could have done it sooner, you know, and it turns out to all be a part of their machinations, which takes us this whole season to start learning about, you know, we don't, we don't realize at first that they have their own agenda, you know, and, but as we start learning it and we start learning their dicks, I mean, Uriel has nothing, nothing to make us want to ever see him again. <laughs> Zachariah, I, I love him as a villain. I, He's great. Mm -hmm. And, then, and yeah. the actor has a blast. Oh Gosh. my God. Yeah. He, he, he gets his teeth into that. He is so good. He just fulfills that role so well. And, um, you know, he's got the snarky humor and, and he just doesn't think anything about, you know, either making horrible decisions or uh, letting them know exactly how, you know, like his frustration at the end of, um, uh, it's a terrible life and he's like you know geez he did all this stuff and they still ended up together right right <laughs> and he's so frustrated um so he's terrific uh you do need that kind of large arc we've already been through a couple of arcs so we need something uh to sustain us through this season and into the next because this is still we're still on Kripke's five-year plan here and is it a surprise now <laughs> knowing Kripke as we now know him more, that the same man who came up with soups are dicks, came up with angels are dicks. I mean, he clearly has <laughs> some kind of focus on like, everybody you think is good are dicks, you know? And well, uh, go, go it's played out in like an early, an early version, you know, that the angels don't care, do what they want, don't care who they run over in the process, you know. Um, so it leaves us with a lot of conflicting feelings and we see the boys dealing with that too, where it's like, you know, Dean may not really believe in them, but there they are and yet, and so, you know, oh, they're gonna help us. No, they're not, they don't care, you know. Anna is the standout, but Anna just lived a human life. So Anna returns to being an angel after a whole human life of experience and clearly that colors her whole viewpoint, you know, is right. it to, you know, who know Uriel and Zachariah probably never were human. They were angels out of the gate and they have no frame of comparison, you know, that Anna and then even Cass because Cass can recall on Jimmy's memories. Well, folks, believe it or not, we have blown through our time. And so let's do a lightning round here where we go around. Everybody tells where people can find you online. Carol Malcolm. You go to Facebook and uh, just plug in Dragon Con Urban Fantasy Track. You'll find us. And uh, we do have an active uh, Facebook page all year long. Electra? Um, you can find me at untilmidnight.com and look for a fun announcement soon. <laughs> awesome. Alexander? Find me online at alexandergideon.net. 
Um, it has links to all of my books, uh, links to my uh, social media as well. Um, can't find me there. You can find me at Alexander Gideon on Twitter, um, Alexander G R Gideon on uh, Facebook, and at Alex Gideon Author on TikTok. Awesome, Carol Stokes. Uh, Carol Stokes. I am often in the uh, T W. I'm never going to get those initials right. The, the Supernatural TFWNC. Thank you. I'm often <laughs> there. I'm on Continuals Facebook, but I'm also on Twitter as True underscore Firesign Ten, and all my fiction is on AO3 under Firesign Ten. Mind the text. Um, you can find me at gailzmartin.com, morganbryce.com. Social media is a variation of either of those names. I run the Supernatural TFWNC group. I am often uh, fortunate to be on the Dragon Con Urban Fantasy uh, track talking about what else but Supernatural. And uh, of course, you can usually find me here in Continual. Well, thank you so much for all of our wonderful panelists. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more Supernatural coming soon here on Continual. So we'll see you online. <laughs> <laughs>